travel and things in association with Sun Destinations, iconic destinations with amazing experiences present in conversation with. I am your host, David Batsoffen, and today my guest is Professor Ryan Blumenthal, who has just written this, Risking Life for Death, Lessons for the Living from the Autopsy Table, if that can be believed, um, and it's published by Jonathan Ball. Ryan, good morning. Welcome to you. Good morning, an honor to be here. It's always good to chat to you. I mean, it takes us months to get together, but that's just part of the, part, part of the joy of getting to actually speak to you. Lessons, Lua. For, lessons for the living from the autopsy table. Do, do expand. Okay. Well, firstly, I mean, since we're on Zoom here, I need to mention first and foremost that because I spend my days surrounded by death. You're right. I like to, I like to spend my, my office hours surrounded by life. That is why there's so many plants around me here. Okay, fair I enough. I, just, I need to uh, just contextualize this for the viewer. Okay. <laughs> so, so again, let's get back to the question, okay, which you yes. so nicely skipped. Tales, yes. lessons for the living from the autopsy table. In what way, Ryan? All right. Well, I mean, my first book, Autopsy, became a South African bestseller. Uh, right. Went into about eight prints. And, um, you know, that was written, I pitched it very uh, superficially. You know, it was, I didn't go deep. Mm. Um, it was, it was, it was very measured. Whereas this book, Risking Life for Death, Lessons for the Living from the Autopsy Table is a deep dive. Like a <laughs> Literally deep dive. Literally and figuratively. Into, yeah. I mean, if you come up too fast, uh, I think you'll bend, <laughs> you know, using a scuba diving metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Th this is a, you know, no... I, I did not hold back. Um, it's it's very intense, and and it's it's it's. I think it's cleverly designed in the fact that look, you have to concentrate. You have to work through this book because the ending is so special. Yeah. So you you can't just read that epilogue. You have to read it from front to back, and I think by the time you reach the epilogue, yeah, I think you're done. Eh? <laughs> you have to go and lie down for about a yeah. week. <laughs> yeah. Ryan, then what is what is the demographic? For the book, or who is well, the demographic? Okay, well, I was quite surprised, and uh, I think uh, I alluded to this. You know, Mick Jagger said that you know when he was a young rock star, you know, most of his demographic were these young nubile females, you know, in their twenties and thirties, and now that he's singing, it's all these old men. <laughs> and uh, I must say, I think I feel a bit like Mick Jagger here. <laughs> I'm getting, <laughs> but you're not eighty. Like, he turned no thank thank goodness not to eh? thank goodness he's not he's eh? just turned eighty and he's still rocking it out even if it is oh, to old good. men yeah <laughs> some some old men yeah and some some elderly uh, female folk on my now a new demographic I should start writing vampire fiction I think <laughs> you know like Twilight Saga stuff eh? for the elderly <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> now yeah. your your specialty. Is death caused by lightning? Now, the last time you and I spoke, uh, which was some some while ago, you told me what the word was. I still can't pronounce it, so you're going to do it for me. All right. Well, yeah, I did my PhD in lightning pathology. So mm -hmm. the scientific name for that is coronopathology, which okay. is the pathology caused by lightning on humans and animals, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I found it fascinating and, and why I focused, uh, you know, on on this for the introduction of this book is because, you know, it happens so quickly. Yeah. And yet it leaves signs. So it's literally like a millisecond, yet it leaves the essence of itself on the human or animal body. And it requires a medical detective mindset to find out what is this thing that is lightning. So it okay. always, every contact leaves a trace. All right, we're going, to, we're going to get into that because your, your book is based on, uh, more or less, on Locard's exchange principle, and we'll get into that in just a moment. But for, for the purposes of our chat today, I've prepared some other questions that you as an author may not have been asked before. And I thought, let me, I want to ramp it up. If you're going to do it for your book and deep dive into your book, I want to deep dive into into Prof. Ryan and find out a little bit more about him. So 
interspersed in the questions about the book, uh, which has just come out and published, as I said earlier, by Jonathan Ball, um, we we go. Uh, you're going to find yourself maybe put on the spot from time to should time. I should I put uh, alcohol in my coffee here? <laughs> this sounds quite scary. I've I got I've got to tell you, Ryan. I would go with preservative fluid rather than alcohol. <laughs> no, 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 no. They're, they're they're not that bad. So so my first question to you is: If you had a superpower, what would you want your superpower to be? Well. Okay, look, I think I have um, a slight superpower as at the moment, which mm -hmm. is um, known as rainforest mind. Okay. Because uh, like there's different kinds of minded people out there. You know, you okay. get meadow minded people, ocean minded people, wasteland minded people. And I think my mind is like a rainforest okay. because it's quite wild up here. I mean, there's trees and plants and butterflies and rain beetles and tangled roots it's quite wild it's a it's a beautiful thing i think okay. however like rainforests people want to chop these minded people down i mean okay. everyone's coming for the rainforest minded so it's important i think to understand that it is somewhat busy up here and um yeah it's i mean it's just full of life and restless and okay. it's so, not uh, a normal minded person okay so that's your superpower or so you are led to believe well it's a uh, i mean it feel some people say it's gifted but it doesn't feel like a gift it's not <laughs> i mean it's a it's a bit of a curse actually there's no um but yeah i i, I do see patterns i'm very okay. into pattern analysis and i have the ability to super focus onto something Okay. And super unfocused and lose it at times, you know, <laughs> as as a forest would, would be. I suppose. Now, take us back to, to Ryan in matric. Did you know as an 18-year-old or 17-year-old, however old you were in matric, that this is the career path that you wanted to follow? Or did you sort of go into banking or whatever and then wake up one morning and then... Uh, I want to chop, not not unlike the sixth sense, instead of seeing dead people, you want to cut up dead people. Well, I always loved puzzle solving. I, you know, I'm a sleight of hand magician and right. I, I do have this puzzle mindedness. Mm -hmm. I, I love a good mystery, hey? Okay. Um, and I originally got into veterinary, uh, into vet at, mm -hmm. at support. Okay. And then there was a singular incident which made me change my mind and going to medicine. Uh, it was a, it was quite a personal incident, but you know, I was walking around um, on the and I just realized that, that I can't do this. Mm. Um, for, for, there were many reasons. For example, I, I love nature and, you know, I didn't want to, I, I love the mystery of nature and I didn't want to go into nature, um, you know, like if I see a dog or a cat thinking, you know, something's wrong with us, I still want that mystery. Okay. And also um, what uh, like kind of upset me was the fact that, you know, like for example, if, if, a, if a dog needs a, a, a special procedure, I think generally speaking, people won't do the hip transplant and would rather put the dog down. And I just didn't mm -hmm. think emotionally that I could handle this okay. kind of stuff. Um, so I just thought I, uh, I wasn't, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be able to cope in, in veterinary. Okay. Um, you know, medicine, yeah, it was more where I fitted. Okay. Uh, you know, with the, just, and, and there's a range in medicine. You know, you've got the surgeons, you've got the, you know, there, there's the philosophers of medicine and there's the hands-on people in medicine, you know. And like yourself. It's, it's a whole, there's a whole range of people in medicine. Okay. So now, the book goes into this theory that I mentioned, the uh, low cards exchange principle, uh, which says that you can neither enter a scene nor leave it without leaving something or taking something with you. Um, is this true in every instance? In other words, is there a way that some criminal who might read the book or who might study Logan's theory uh, or uh, Logan's principle might say, all right, if I wear a hazmat suit, and I wear gloves, surgical gloves, and I wear booties and all that, I will not leave a trace. The right, trace so just will be left the... on the hazmat suit, and then whatever he does with that or she does with that will get rid of so that just, trace. Just, 
just to contextualize for your uh, viewers, what is low cards exchange principle? In, uh, so low cards exchange principle was created by Professor Edmund Lowcard in 1643. And he said that wherever he goes, whatever he touches, even consciously or subconsciously, will leave trace evidence behind. So if you enter a, a death scene, you'll leave something of yourself there and you'll take something with. Only human failure to understand it and identify it can diminish its value. So even tampering leaves a trace. So you can try and tamper, but there will be mm -hmm. signs of tampering. It is so brilliant. And I mean, we eat, breathe, sleep, dream this principle day and night. We use it to catch murderers. Mm -hmm. And and it, it is so pervasive. You know, it works on the microscopic level and the cosmic level. Everything. I mean, you love the bushveld. You know, if you think about it critically, when you go into the bushveld, all the signs, you know, the spoor, the, the feces, you know, this will tell you what's there without having seen that animal. Correct. Even even in the ocean, I mean, you can tell what's in the ocean without putting a toe in the ocean, just from the signs of the life on the beach. Mm. So every contact leaves a trace, and even if you temper, as you say, or try to get um, clever and try and fool the system, those signs will leave traces also. And the key is to pick up the signs of tempering. Okay. Now. How did you choose the cases that you that you've used in the book? Um, what made those stand out from the rest? Because you must have, over your career as a as a pathologist, you must have had dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of people across your table um, that have that have taught you stuff because you've opened them up and and you've had a look, and now you've learned something with every interaction, even though, Part of that interaction is with a dead person. So what made these case studies the ones that you said, I'm going to put them in a book? All right, that is a very good question. And there are a lot of case studies in this book. I've been doing forensic pathology for over 20 years. And uh, every single case is a story. Every single case is a wow factor. Mm -hmm. So because of the climate we live in, um, I had to take cases where there was consent. So that was my main issue here. It had to have been published. It had to have been through an ethics committee. It had to have been sanitized through the lawyers. So unfortunately, stuff was taken out of the book um, that I couldn't put in um, just because of consent reasons. So what's in here, I had to fight tooth and nail to get into that book. Because I see in your acknowledgements, you, you thank your lawyer. <laughs> your legal advice team yeah. for helping you stumble through this because i should imagine that if something if you had posted or written something and then the family had come back the blowback could have been quite serious even yeah, if you tried I mean, to disguise the patient because that's why bad. it's called risking life for death i mean we risk our lives for others deaths i mean i did take risk in writing this book uh, there's there's risk involved okay. and the the people will identify themselves in the book the families etc but everything's been through ethics committee. Everything's been formally published. Um, I've just taken it and put it into layman's language afterwards. Okay. Because because obviously, I, I know being married to a doctor myself, although she's a chemical pathologist, my wife, um, I always wanted her to do forensics uh, because it fascinates me on, on many levels. And I remember doing a TV shoot years ago where we were working at a particular mortuary. Uh, the, the side we were working in was no longer used, but the other side was. And we'd be sitting having lunch and that white vehicle would pull up and a gurney would come out and a leg or a hand would fall out from under the sheet. And you go, I wonder what the backstory is. Um, you do this on a daily basis. I then got hold of my wife and I said, I've been offered a tour around the, around the, the lab. Should I take it? Um, and she said, two things will happen to you. One, you will never unsee what you're about to see. And secondly, you will never get rid of the smell. So unless you really, really, really need to see it, don't. And I didn't. Well, well you've got a very wise wife, firstly. I need to comment on that. And second of all, obviously, we don't just enter this field. You know, this is years and years of professionalism and slow introduction through physiology, anatomy, and doing all the basic medical sciences. And we choose people with the right stuff. We don't want okay. to, you know, 
anybody off the streets. And and also before, you know, only those with a substantial and peculiar interest in the field may attend an autopsy, uh, according to the Inquest Act, which we interpret as, you know, investigating officers or, you know, physicians that were involved in the case, etc. This is not Disneyland. This is not Hollywood. We don't want yeah. people off the street here. You know, anything can trigger anyone. I also had to keep that in mind when writing this book. We don't want to trigger anyone. So it's got to be done in a very sensitive and very professional manner. It's, it's a huge responsibility. Uh, actually, and, you know, the average person, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, the no, average no. person will, will only see about two dead people in their life, actually. Mm. Two or three dead people, because death is hidden from society. It is. You know, maybe you, you're driving around the road and you may see a, a, a dead pedestrian, or, or maybe you, you come across someone dead, you know, in your life. But generally speaking, death is hidden from society. Mm. And death, obviously, uh, there's a difference between death and autopsy as well. Because if you, as you were, you just alluded to, you're driving down the road, there's been a car accident, there is the body or bodies on the side of the road. It's a split second and you either absorb it or you don't. But standing next to a table where you have cut somebody open and there are people watching is a whole different kettle of fish. And with that in mind, Ryan, do you have, when you step up to the table, and there is now a cadaver lying in front of you. Are there routines or are there moments that you do some sort of ritual before you start? Just so that, that you are now focused, as you said, you can become hyper-focused. And you also realize that the person in front of you had a family, has a family, had a life up until the time they landed up on your table. Well, look, we're still doctors when all is said and done, and we took the Hippocratic Oath or the modern version of it, the, the Geneva Convention. So we're still doctors when all is said and done, and it's about absolute professionalism. And when all is said and done, I mean, we're scientists, so mm. we want to get in there, get our data, get out. And we, you talk about like before the autopsy, there's a thing called pre-autopsy. You okay. don't just jump into an autopsy. You know, you got to conceptually crash test what you think you're going to find. Mm. Also, my book, Risking Life for Death, I mean, there's stories in this book where pathologists have been injured and killed from just suddenly starting an autopsy. You, I, you know, I, found that, I found that fascinating because I don't think people realize the, the danger you put yourselves in. Um, and, and maybe you can expand on that in, in a moment, but, but finish your train of thought. Well, look... This field has risks. Let's just, uh, whereas a surgeon is exposed to extreme stuff, mm. we're exposed to extreme, extreme stuff. If, if that sums it up, you know, we get people dying under the most extreme conditions. So there could be toxic chemicals. There could be extreme infections. Uh, these could be political cases, you know, where there's mm. mafia or, you know, some organization behind the death and, and you're the kippy that's doing the autopsy, you know. These things have have risk. And and also, you never know what you're going to find. It's literally by the grace of God that you go into that body. Okay. For example, in my book, I tell a story of, a once again, a vet, a veterinary pathologist who did an autopsy on a horse. And a small droplet of blood entered his mouth, and he died of fatal glanders. Wow. Then there's cases of uh, forensic pathologists, human forensic pathologists, that are minding their own business, doing their autopsy, cutting open the stomach, and are suddenly overcome by hydrogen cyanide gas because the person killed themselves by drinking potassium cyanide. Okay. And potassium cyanide reacts with hydrogen chloride in your stomach, and it forms hydrogen cyanide gas. And then there's a host of infectious diseases out there. There's chemicals. You, you know, people fall into whole entire vats of organophosphates or some other chemical, and now you've got to do this autopsy on this hazardous case so yeah there's there's risks and hazards involved so if we if we look at the book um and the cases in the book or even over your career because if you've been doing this for for a couple of decades now and somebody like myself says to you what was the most interesting case that you've ever had to deal with is there one specific case that almost immediately comes to mind Okay, so uh, you, that's a frequently asked question, and I usually um, respond by saying we do not find cases in forensic pathology interesting. All right, we do not so find what... other people's unnatural deaths interesting. However, if you were to rephrase that question and ask me 
what's the most unusual or you know academically intriguing case then right. i would venture and and argue but we do not find other people's unnatural deaths interesting by no All means right. that's so morbid curiosity a, you see it's i'm a layman i don't i don't realize yeah. the terminology so let me rephrase the question using your words is there a let me do, let me just then rephrase it totally is there a case that has stood out because of its uniqueness that has made you step back and go wow okay there's something well, else. Okay, so in this book, I discuss rare and unusual cases. And I mean, when we're, when I talk about rare and unusual cases, we're talking like a singular case study that will be published in an international journal because no one has ever seen or heard of this before. Right. And I've got about three or four in my book here, which I want to again want to show the public. So, for example, you know, just off off the cuff here, the the longest appendix in the world, you know. Was actually twenty, I think it's twenty four point five centimeters. It's it's in that range, twenty four point five centimeters. And then I was doing an autopsy and I found one of about twenty twenty three centimeters or something like that. It's in the book. Okay. You know, so that that was fascinating. Then I, uh, you know, because we look at everything, there's nowhere to hide at autopsy. We look at every, you know, from the autopsy table, you can tell so much about what's happening in society. You can tell the health of the nation. You can tell if an new or emergent gang has moved into a neighborhood. You can tell if there's new drugs or new diseases, all this without venturing outdoors. And then, and we look for everything. So, you know, I had a very unusual case where um, this guy died from breathing in his own brain. You know, yeah, he aspirated on his own brain. So you'll have to read the book for that. There's cases of brain in the lung tissue and there's cases of lung tissue in the brain. So wow. there's very rare stuff okay. in forensic pathology. We've had very unusual uh, deaths. So, and and there's a whole chapter in this book about rare and unusual deaths from our 20-year career. And it's still, and there's still a lot of career to come. So there may be a, a third God. book in the third book in the series. Yeah, look, I'm not ready to start writing just yet. This, this, you know, writing a book is labor-intensive. It is hard work. It's discipline. It takes sacrifice. It, it really drains the bone marrow out of you. And and I'm quite frankly not ready to pick up another pen just yet. <laughs> what is the most adventurous thing you've ever done? You mean besides this interview with you? <laughs> <laughs> well answered, Ryan. Well answered. <laughs> yeah. yeah, look, I mean, yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one to 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 answer. Hey, there is a one or two anecdotes in the book. Um uh, that uh, you know, every year, and I'm I'm wearing you know Sony to see regalia I, here. I was about I was going to ask you about that. So about two years ago, I uh, was a solo rider, and I literally on day two fell off fell off the the umco drop. Uh, I literally I don't know what happened. I uh, lost concentration, and I descended and fractured my my left wrist, and then I had to literally cycle 30 Ks to the water table to get help. Um, so I literally had to strap my wrist with duct tape and twigs and wilderness medicine, which is doing what you can with what you got where you are. And it, it was a tough, long three hours of hell. And I eventually got there. And anyway, to cut a long story short, you know, it was in the COVID era and I had to go for orthopedic surgery and when I finally got to the orthopedic ward, I was the only non-crime victim in the in the wards. There, there were three other victims there, and they were all crime victims in South mm -hmm. Africa. You know, we, we have about 70 murders a day. Yeah, it's quite wild, yeah? Right. And and anyway, I had to go put on my hospital gown. You know, everything was there. So I go into the toilet, and I, I put on this, what I thought was a theater cap. But I was quite fascinated because there was space for my ears. And I thought, this is really world class. <laughs> and I would inadvertently put the gown on the wrong way around. Because, you know, I work in a mortuary. What are, I haven't been in a living ward in ages. And I walk out there and the theatre sister comes up to me, you know, with my ears poking out of these holes <laughs> and this gown the wrong way around. And she just walked up to me and said, Professor. <laughs> and the whole ward just cracked up. <laughs> Anyway, it was, I it was my you underpants. Were wearing the underpants. <laughs> it was the underpants that I put on my head. I thought it was a theater cap. 
Right. <laughs> <laughs> Even pathologists have senses of humor, people. Uh, just let's go back to, to the lightning deaths, because I don't think that populations, and be that anywhere in the world, know how many people, and animals for that matter, are killed by lightning annually. We get to hear of one or two cases uh, here in South Africa, perhaps where a young child is struck by lightning, but it's more than just the the occasional person, isn't it? Well, maybe be because of your show, you know, the travels, etc. I can talk, I can contextualize it like that. And I should mm -hmm. also, I just want to mention about statistics. So, for example, your viewers, you know, how many go buy lottery tickets? Anyway, here's a quite a fact, a statistical fact. The chances of you dying on the way to buy your lottery ticket in South Africa is greater than you winning the lottery. The chances of you dying as a pedestrian vehicle accident or motor vehicle accident driver or being murdered is greater than you winning the lottery ticket. If you look how many road traffic fatalities there are versus lottery winners, you know, it, it, it's quite obvious. Another thing is lightning deaths. There's actually more lightning uh, deaths and more lightning injuries than there are lottery winners. So right, we, okay. we're a lightning prone country and we need to be very serious about our lightning here. So uh, this involves all our sports from rugby or swimming or cricket to even going out in the bush felt. You know, if you're in an open top to OSV and you're watching leopards and there's a thunderstorm, I would get indoors. Eh? I wouldn't watch those leopards. The risk is that great. However, we don't think about things like that as South Africans. So I'm very risk aware. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, there's the dangerous neighborhood metaphor. Some neighborhoods are more dangerous than others. And every time you go outdoors, it's by the grace of God and uh, there's risk involved. Yeah. When one leaves the eaves, one is at risk. Okay, I, I like that, when one leaves the eaves. I'd never thought of it that way. Yeah, it depends if it's eaves, Y-V-E-S, or eaves, E-V-E-S. I'll just well, say eaves. In, in both cases, it depends who the eaves You're at are. risk. <laughs> you're at yes, risk you're at, at risk. the end of the day. Right, we're coming to the end of our discussion. My, these these uh, chats go by so quickly. The book, um, Risking Life for Death, um, Lessons for the Living from the Autopsy Table, published by Jonathan Ball, written by Professor Ryan Blumenthal. Ryan, before we, we go, because we've still got a few minutes, this um, low-cards exchange principle, does it work in relationships, in human live relationships where you will take something into a relationship and leave with something good, bad, or indifferent. So this entire book is about the epilogue, you know, because this book is about a recipe for happiness and a philosophy for growing old better. Because mm. if you realize that low cost exchange principle works in all spheres of life, it even works on you. So having read hundreds of suicide notes, you know, and I know this sounds a bit arrogant, but don't talk to a psychiatrist about happiness. Come talk to a forensic pathologist about happiness because <laughs> suicide notes are very clear messages to the living. And there's basically three themes why people kill themselves. These are your work, your health, and your relationships. And I call these the three battlefronts of life. Your work battlefront, your health battlefront, your relationship battlefront. All of them are prone and susceptible to low cards exchange principle. Your contacts in life, it's called contact theory. Your happiness depends on what you're coming into contact with. Your relationships depend on what you're coming in contact with and your work, you know, how much work and how much boredom. And this book attacks each battlefront with a creative intensity. So getting back to your question, sorry, I was just contextualizing. Fair relationships. Enough. You can use uh, low cards exchange principle to spice up your relationship. And obviously it's a two-edged sword. It can also destroy a relationship. For example, if you see your partner with perfume or aftershave of another person on them, this indicates a possible affair. So low cards exchange principle can inter can can indicate something that's going on. And then obviously could, if you have it a could, deep... It could, but yeah. if, if you just extrapolate on that, if I may, yeah. it could also mean that your partner has been to um, a store in a local mall and tried on a different perfume to come home to you and say, what do you think of this? And in the meantime, you've already taken out a gun or a knife and you're prepared to kill them over a smell that you've never had, seen or uh, smelt before. Well, this is why it's a, a deeper understanding of your partner. Because mm. also, if you understand low cards exchange principle, you can have a deeper understanding of your partner. Right. You know, which can help uh, enhance the relationship. Okay. 
because every contact leaves a trace. You know, when you meet someone, there's the person of face value. Meanwhile, this person could be into gathering dinosaur bones in the Gobi Desert or <laughs> double dahlia growers. You never know, the, you know what they're into. Yeah. And low cards exchange principle can tell you so much about a person. You've never used your magic in an autopsy setting, have you? You've never gone, ta-da, and pulled a rabbit from a corpse. Well, sleight of hand magic is about misdirection and it's about fooling people. And the concepts and principles of sleight of hand magic transfer very nicely to uh, criminology and forensics because it's about a deeper noticing. I don't use the word observation. I use the word noticing, like a mm. real scientist notices. It's an active thing. So if you're watching a sleight of hand magician do a subterfuge, you've got to notice the subterfuge. So too, if it's a perfect murder or something, you've got to notice what's off, what's a bit different, etc. Yeah. yeah. The book, once again, Risking Life for Death, Lessons for the Living from the Autopsy Table by Ryan Blumenthal, published by Jonathan Ball. Ryan, as always, time has gone by far too quickly. Um, thank you for joining me. I wish you all the best with this book. And, and I do, because we're getting close and close. I do look forward to meeting you in the not too distant future <laughs> in person, and we can actually sit down and, and, and have a chat about what this is all about um, and, and all of those interesting things. So once again, thank you very much for joining me here on In Conversation With. Thanks for accommodating me.